Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, your journey, our passion. And by Lear, a global leader in automotive seating and electrical systems. This is Auto Line After Hours with John McElroy and Gary Vassalash. Episode 326 for April 1st of 2016. Not your soccer mom's minivan. Watch Auto Line After Hours live at AutoLine.tv every Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. That's 12 p.m. Pacific. You can subscribe to this podcast for free by searching for AutoLine in iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube. Mr. Gary Vassalash. John, how are you? Doing great. It's great to be back in the studio. Back from New York. Yeah, that was a great show that we did last week. It was. If I hadn't come back with a cold, I would have been happier, but uh, it was a good show. Oh, you caught a cold in New York, eh? Oh, yeah. Too bad. Go sit in a sauna. That's my advice. Ah. (laughs) (laughs) Sweat it out of you. (laughs) I'll work on that. Okay. So we got to let everybody know we got Pete Bigelow back from Autoblog. Pete, great having you here in the studio. Thank you for having me back. It's uh, nice to be here. And, and of course, you were on the Pacifica launch, the Chrysler Pacifica launch, and we've got one of them in the studio. And the reason we got that in the studio is we also have Mike Downey, the chief engineer for the Chrysler Pacifica. Mike, great having you on Autoline After Hours. Thank you. Great to be here. So... The last time there was an all-new Pacifica was 2008, right? Yes, yep. And, and here you guys with... So, so this is all new. Now, when some people say all new, they mean like a eh, little bit new. This is all new. Tell us what you guys did. Absolutely. This is absolutely an all-new uh, Chrysler Pacifica minivan from the ground up. Uh, we started right from the platform itself. We said we wanted to start a new platform, something that would able to give us some of the great things, of a great ride, great handling, quietness of the car. Those are some of the, the first attributes. So we really wanted to start right from the beginning, right from the bones. And we said, we need a minivan with, with a great backbone. We feel the minivan, in, the, the segment itself, um, with the, the, the inherent nature of a sliding door, makes it hard to really have a, a great platform, like, a, like a, a, a sedan type architecture. And we said, you know what, we need that. A minivan industry needs it. So that's how we kind of started out with an all new platform. So it is um, entirely new platform, uh, different than the town and country. Mm-hmm. And we really tried to emphasize that torsion bending of, of the underbody architecture. And we ended up uh, actually nearly doubling the, uh, the, the torsional stiffness from the exiting town and country. And that really formed the backbone of what we feel, the, the driving experience that you get out of, the, out of the Pacifica. You can really feel that, feel it's got a great backbone. And we turned one of the weaknesses of having the sliding door into really the strength of it by using that center section where we have our tub to be the, the main backbone architecture and, and strength of, of, our, of the Pacifica's architecture. You must have looked at uh, Honda and Toyota, mm-hmm. too, because uh, with the Sienna and the Odyssey, uh, they've moved ahead of sales of the old town and country and uh, the, the caravan. Although, if you put the Dodge and the Chrysler mm-hmm. together, it still yeah. was number one in the segment, but yep. they had gone ahead of you guys. And I got to believe you must have torn their vans apart too to see what you had to do to beat them. Absolutely, yes. Benchmarking for especially when you do a new architecture, or even when you just do a top hat, benchmarking is the first place you start at. So, um, a couple, you know, uh, good competitive set of um, vehicles that we had there. We understood it. We understood where they where they were at, and they understood that some of their weaknesses as well. We understood that we really that's how we realized for the minivan segment. All of the minivans really kind of lacked that torsion, torsion and bending stiffness. And we would drive other competitive sets, and we could feel it. We could feel that there was a weakness. And, and that's how we kind of started off saying, we can't be, even though they're, you know, they may be in the market, we know we can do a lot better than where they were at. So the, the architecture that we set out really was using them as our starting point, and we really leapfrogged where they're at. And that, that driving experience that we, that we feel is we, when we drive our Pacifica, we drive the competitive set, we drive our town and country, we really feel how we've leapfrogged the, the, the industry of the minivans. Now, you, know, you mentioned that you use the tub as, as a, a component to mm-hmm. get more torsional rigidity. And, and Pete, I know that when I drove it over the Ortega Highway, which I'm sure you drove it over the yeah. Te- Ortega Highway at speeds that we would ordinarily drive things that are not minivans, that you know you could feel that now. So so before the the tub was a separate piece, and now it's integrated into right. the. And explain what you mean by tub. Yes, I'm sorry. not sure what yeah. you mean. Let's so let's start let's start at the beginning. So 
uh, the Chrysler Pacifica, and really all, all in the town and country as well, has a, what we call our stow-and-go tub. So right in the middle, if you open up your sliding door and you look on the middle of the floor pan, there's a, there's a tub on both sides for the, for the middle row, uh, right side and left side. That tub is actually the storage space for the stow-and-go seats. So we have the Chrysler exclusive, they have the ability to, to fold, in, uh, fold your seats right into the floor and then put your load flow over it so you have all the storage capability that you would want. So the, the tub that you can see there, is, it could also be used for storage. On the current town and country, the body in white structure is just a hole. So as you're going through the, the body shop, you can see a, a hole. And then later, as, you, as we went to the trim shop, you'd put in pl basically plastic fillers that were less, less structural, if you will. So for the Pacifica, we said we, we, want it, we need to strengthen that. That's the backbone of the car. It's right in the middle of the car. And those tubs that inherently could be a weak point, we said, let's turn that into structure. So now in the, the body in white arch structure, when you, when you take out all the, all the plastic parts and the carpet parts and, and you look inside of that tub, those are, those are steel parts. Those are steel parts that tie, structurally tie, the front end of the vehicle with the back end of the vehicle. And that's what really gives us a lot of that, that's that backbone of the entire vehicle. Gotcha. So I happen to own one of those 2016 town and countries, and it's fascinating to, to go from my car at the airport to driving mm -hmm. the new Pacifica in California. And one of, the, one of the chief things I noticed was how much quieter this car yeah, was. Right. I was wondering if you could talk about some of the, the things you, you did to make it uh, more quiet and some of the active noise cancellation yeah, technology right. in the car. Yeah, you brought, up, probably, probably the start, you brought up active noise cancellation. That's, that's probably where it all starts, right? Standard active noise cancellation. Uh, every Pacifica has it regardless of, of your price class. So active noise cancellation is basically a, we have um, microphones in the headliner of the vehicle. It takes in the noise in the cabin. And then we send out actually a, another noise that's opposite, equal, in, in, uh, equal in strength but opposite in frequency to counteract that noise. So even though the noise may be airborne, your ears don't hear it. It's, been, it's canceled by this, the sound system that we have. And that, we found that to be a, a, a huge benefit to the noise. And it reacts fast enough even it, though yeah. it's measuring oh, yeah. the noise yeah. in the cabin. Oh, yeah. Absolutely, Because yeah. you'd think the noise would get yeah, to you your are, ear yeah. as fast as right. it would get to no, the it's, microphone. It's an incredible, incredible technology. And, it, and, it's, and we feel, right, we, we drive them with and without um, the active noise cancellation, and it is incredibly effective. And that's one of the big enablers. The, the other enabler really is what I talked about is the, just the torsion and stiffness, the bending. The amount that the, our cars, the, the Pacifica, bends and twists and moves that things that changes pressure inside the cabin is reduced and that just naturally reduces the amount of sound that you have and then probably the third most critical thing we did um, was our rear suspension so we went from uh, uh, basically a solid axle or, or uh, twist beam suspension went to independent rear suspension in a really unique cool thing well, I think one of the most unique suspension attributes that quiet is down is we've gone to in the rear um, uh, called a comfort leak suspension and that's the bushing that attaches the trailing arm to the body. And in most suspensions, you got you have one bushing that attaches the suspension to the body. And you have to, in, in most applications, most people compromise. They say, I want to, I want a really tight handling, but I want a soft ride. So if you make the bushing really soft, your handling is is mushy. If you make the bushing really strong, then it's harsh in the back end. So we said we had a came up with a brilliant idea, which we which we love and really can feel it in the car, called this comfort link. And it takes the one bushing that's that that's a compromise. We put it into two bushings, and they're 90 degrees to each other. One bushing that's up down is 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 stiff, so we have great uh, great um, handling. And the bushing that controls the 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 harshness is very soft, so it makes for that soft ride. So it, it got us into a no compromise position. So we didn't have to compromise between the ride and, the, and the, uh, the ride quality and the steering. This new way sounds more expensive. So clearly you're investing more in the product than in the yeah, past. Yeah, it's, it's a little bit more, not a lot. It's absolutely well worth it. And um, we've, we had both designs. We drove both designs and, and the, the quietness, especially the, the back end quietness of the car was, was just there was no way we couldn't do it. And, and we just didn't, we just, the whole theme was no compromises, right? We do not want to make compromises. You engineer a car, you make trade-offs every day. And you want the customer to have, you want to have it all, but then physics catches up and you say, oh, I have to give up some noise, to give some steering. And, and we had a solution that said, this truly is, gives them both a great ride and then the, the, the great noise as well. So all those things, I think the, the active noise cancellation, the tight twisting and bending, and then the rear suspension, you know, independent rear suspension as well as the, uh, the comfort link really makes it uh, a really a, a quiet vehicle. So, you know, data, I always like engineers like talking data. So we have um, 
a measure called articulation index, which measures how clearly you can hear voices in the car. Um, we have industry best 83% articulation index um, on, the, on the Pacifica, uh, outstanding number. And, and you can just, when you drive down, as I, I tell everybody, you spew all these numbers and all these facts. But when you're in the car, just try to talk to the person next to you. And it's, ama it's amazing how, how well you can hear the person. So um, that's really a, the, the proof is in the pudding when we drive those cars, like this articulation index thing, which probably is you know, a bunch of mumbo jumbo. It's real. And, and when you know, drive it compared to our competitive set and compared to the existing uh, exiting town and country, it's, it's a much quieter vehicle. Is that more challenging to accomplish in a minivan than in, say, a sedan? Yeah, um, overall quietness in a minivan, just the segment itself is because of the sliding door. Uh, the sliding door in the middle structure is inherently weaker. So first of all, the sliding doors are large sliding doors. Wind noise is always uh, uh, inherent, inherently more difficult than a triple sealed sedan door. So sliding doors in, in the whole industry is, is more difficult to make it quiet. And then as, you know, as I spoke of earlier, the, the vehicle stiffness is harder to achieve. So generally minivans had been more noisy um, in the whole industry. And I think we're taking, uh, uh, we really wanted to say that we want this to be a sedan-like experience. So we, we think we're able to really get that a lot closer to a sedan. Mm -hmm. And you've lowered this compared to the last town and country. Did that have any effect on uh, engineering the vehicle? Yeah, well, it helped lowering. It, it definitely helped for our, um, our now, aerodynamic. Now, less ground clearance or just no, a lower like, roof yeah, height? Same, same, but 150 millimeters of ground clearance, so comparable to where we were. The height of, of the car itself w was slightly lower, about 11 to 12 millimeters lower. Um, definitely helped for aerodynamics, so it, the less aerodynamic drag helps the, the, the wind noise on the outside as well. Um, we also, you know, t talking about aerodynamics is another great accomplishment that we did, you know, for, for quietness, another, another great enabler for, for quietness. Um, we have a 0.3 CD drag coefficient for, for our, this town and country. Um, so extremely low number. It's a sedan-like number that we're very proud of. It helped both for our, our fuel economy, our, our unsurpassed fuel economy, as well as it helps quiet the car down. It has to push the car through less air with that lower drag. You said 0.23? 0.3. 0.3. 0.30. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I definitely noticed, uh, you know, looking at my fuel economy throughout the drive in California, we were... What were you getting? I was getting 25, 26 miles per gallon, and, uh, you know, and that was in a lot of stop-and-go highway driving. So compared to my town and country again, which is kind of what I had in my head the entire drive, uh, that was a significant improvement. Yeah. Yeah, talk to us about the par train. Yeah, so the powertrain, we're really excited about the powertrain. It's the upgraded Pentastar um, V6 engine, 287 horsepower with it. Um, so it's, it comes with our upgraded Pentastar, it's outstanding, outstanding engine, um, better than the, the previous Pentastar. Um, it's, it's more efficient, more lightweight, has more power. Um, and that's teamed up with our nine-speed torque flight transmission, um, which, is, which has been, we spent countless hours tuning in the transmission, nine-speed transmission, outstanding for fuel economy. Um, and really we're able to, to tune that transmission. It's a great fit with the, the V6 and the higher torque engine. How did you work with the design staff? And the, the reason I'm asking is, you know, when you get a minivan, it's all about interior space. Yep. And you don't want to compromise it. This is right. why people buy minivans, because they need that yep. interior Absolutely. space. So how did you work with them? Did you set the parameters and then said, okay, you guys can do whatever you want as long as you don't violate this? Or did they say, here's the look we want, now make it yep. fit to the engineering side? Yeah, and the answer is both. <laughs> The answer is both, right? So certainly, uh, when you're creating a car, you start with this in the sketch phase, and and so the, our design office, outstanding design office, had you know beautiful looking sketches, and from there we kind of get into the then we start technicalizing it, if you will, and we create the hard points. So you know we kind of drove like the length of the car, that we have the identical length of the Pacifica versus the town and country, um, so we kind of use that to, to, to mold the the mold the uh, the mold the sketches as we got into the clay phase. And then from there, we said, like you said, we wanted the interior to be even more. So we ended up, one of the great enablers we did that really makes the, the stance more bold is we increased the track, the, the distance between the wheels and plan view, um, f uh, four inches. But in the, the overall, width of the overall width of the vehicle is only one inch wider. So we gave a lot to the customer on the inside. Uh, How did you do that? Making, four inches is a lot. Yep, so we ended up pulling two on each side, so we ended up pulling the wheels more more outboard, if you will, but still maintaining it underneath the, the body side aperture. So we did, we took, so that ended up giving us um, nearly 200 cubic feet of interior cubic, interior space. So it's, it's, we have even more space than what we had. The, the, the utility of a minivan, right, that's why people buy it. They want to have their, get their kids in and out. They want to have a lot of stuff. They want to be able to load, you know, four by eight pieces of plywood. So 
that was an absolute requirement as we were working and designing back and forth with the design office. So, so, so the width of this versus the width of Pete's is about oh. 25, yeah, about 25 millimeters wide. So, so, that's, so that's just one inch. Yep. yep. But yet you've got that additional the track. Yes. It's amazing. Yeah, that's that's impressive. So, yep. so, so, so it helps on the inside, right? So if anybody could have just pushed the wheels way out and then just made the car wider, hurt, right. would hurt your your aerodynamics, would hurt your fuel economy, but. We had room to give underneath where the t where the the position of the wheel wells and the tires hmm. to be able to accomplish that. So now you're going to look at your car and say, "Wow, those cars, those tires are way back there." I know it's it's a shame that I got it just last year and I <laughs> don't need to replace it for yeah. a while because now I yep. now I know what uh, what the newer sibling is. And you know, it's, I, I also find it remarkable. I mean, you guys have the nine speed and. Mm -hmm. um, you know the way you've you've cleaned it up. There's there's uh, you got a lot of room on the IP from uh, the, the the way you uh, shift the gears. Why don't you talk about yeah. that? Yeah. Well, you know one of the one of the big things for um, what we've had we've got a lot of features, right? We have a beautiful eight and a half screen, eight and a half inch screen, um, disassociated screen, which we love. Where we we've taken the screen and you know like a, a packaging problem is you have a a big big screen, you have a big radio, takes up a lot of space, a lot of place space on your instrument panel. So one of the unique things we did is we went to what we call a disassociated screen for the radio. And we have just the screen, it's just like a, like your TV set, small little thin thing that we can put on the IP in the, the radio head unit itself with all the, the guts and, and the working part is, is buried deeper into the instrument panel. So it allows the, the guts to be far away from where the customer is at and at the same time as a, as a beautiful big screen. So it was one enabler that opened up a lot of packaging space. So when you say disassociated, panel. you mean the screen is not connected to the guts just of the with system. the cable. Yep, just connected with the cable. I've never heard that yep. term. Yep, so it's just connected uh, just connected with the cable. So it's the first application that we have here at Chrysler with that. So it allows the screen to be up in the front and then the guts buried in the back and you just have the cable connection. Kind of like you're plugging a TV into a cable box, I guess, would be the, mm -hmm. the best way to do it. So that opened up a lot of packaging space. Mm -hmm. um, we also have, our, as you mentioned, the, uh, the dial shift uh, yeah, rotary the, knob. Rotary knob. All right, so that you don't have to have the all the all the gears to, to shift it down. That saves all that. You imagine all the packaging space that they, that gives you as well. So so it's opened up a lot of space for all the features that we've got. We have all our safety features and uh, our electronic stability control, lane departure warning. We put all those buttons up in the front, easily accessible for the customer. Mm -hmm. You know, it's John's point about people buying minivans for the interior was engineering the interior. The seats and the way the seats articulate and fold and move. I mean, was was that almost as difficult as engineering the body structure? Yeah, it re it really is, right? I mean, it's because the the when you're designing the body structure, you can just be you can just be an engineer for the most part, right? People see the outside, but they don't really see what's behind it. They don't have to function the body in white as much. So, structurally challenges, right? You have to apply the laws of physics for the body structure. Designing on the interior does get more challenging because you have all the human interface now, right? You just can't like, I'm going to make this strong and I'm going to add a piece of magnesium here. It's, it's what's the customer going to touch? What's he going to feel? How's the seat going to move? How's the seat going to feel? So it becomes more, a little bit more of, a, of an art, I guess, on a lot of the parts that the customer touches as opposed to the more structural part of a, of a body in white. Mm -hmm. Speaking of designing the interior and some of those choices, I thought it was interesting to note that and the models that have the vacuum cleaner, yeah. um, you know, the the vacuum cleaner components took up that that spot in the rear where the spare tire would right. be, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, just that was fascinating to think of of the engineering behind the vacuum cleaner of a car. Yeah, it's not something I'm accustomed to uh, right. to thinking about. Yeah, one of the coolest things for that, right? Because we want to have a vacuum cleaner. It was really a practical thing. And one of the one of the I think the the coolest stories we had is we said, hey, you know, who who else is a vacuum cleaner? We benchmarked Honda. that. Yep. And we said, where's their vacuum cleaner? Oh, it's, it's in the back, in their, in their tailgate. And we're like, well, is that where the, why'd they put it? Where's the dirt? You want your vacuum cleaner where your dirt is. You wanna, do you want to climb in through your, your lift gate and then pull the hose through and then vacuum where the dirt is? Or, or do you want the vacuum right where the dirt is? So we said, well, well where's the dirt? So we actually did study. We did part of our research was to look at the minivan. Dirt. <laughs> finding the Finding dirt. So we looked where, where dirt was and we said, hey, the most dirt in a minivan is right when we open up the sliding door and your kids are getting in, that's where the most dirt was. So we said, we're going to put the vacuum cleaner right where the dirt is. So that's, that's the, how it ended up. Where, so you know, where is it? So it's just as you open the door, it's right in the C pillar of okay. the door. So you open up oh. your sliding door, it's right next to the, uh, the second row seat. Hmm. So you're just able to easily pull it out and you can, you can uh, vacuum up your mess. Also, it has a cord long enough to reach every square inch of the, uh, of, of the, of the van itself. 
And also in the back, we have an extension cord, so we can double the length. So not only can you vacuum your car, but you can vacuum your, your husband or wife's car next to it in the garage. Yeah, it's, it's just very interesting practical. the way that hose articulates in and out. Yeah. And uh, just <laughs> goes right like, back like in. Like a slinky, kind of like a slinky effect. Yeah, 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 yeah. it goes back in. Yeah. When will this go on sale? Uh, so it's going to be uh, reaching dealers the middle of April, probably be in, in uh, critical mass around the end of April in dealerships. And then you got a, a plug-in hybrid coming yeah. too, but that's later in the year? Yeah, when later, will that be out? Later this year, there's the plug-in hybrid. We're very excited about that. It's a 16 kilowatt um, uh, battery. It's going to have 13 mile, uh, sorry, 30 miles of all electric range. Uh, it's going to get an MPGE of 80 miles per gallon city. So really practical for, for if, if you don't, don't want to use gas and you have a family, it's probably the only alternative out there. So that 30 miles we think is outstanding for. That's pretty good. For yeah, a vehicle this for size. Vehicle that size with the utility, and, and it and it's gonna it looks just like just like the Pacifica. You're not gonna have a stigma of looking like an electric car. Um, if you so if you're if you have a lifestyle, you drive your kids to school, come back home, go to the grocery store, pick up the kids, uh, drop off the kids at soccer. You do less than 30 miles in a day. You don't have to use gas. You come in at night, you plug it in. We have less than a uh, two-hour uh, charge time with a level two charger and uh, you can go the whole week and you don't have to go to the gas station or, or even burn gas. So. So, so in this case you're using that tub to store the batteries, right. correct? Yep, so the plug-in hybrids will use, the, as I mentioned, the tubs in the center of the car where the, the seats stow, that's where the battery goes. So um, you would not have stone go seats, but you would replace that with the battery. Mm -hmm. Hey, we've even got a number of questions come in here uh, from our viewers. Uh, one speaks specifically to this. Armand wants to know, did the stow and go tubs have to be stronger because that's where the batteries were going to go? No, well, we, we, uh, because the, the stow and go tubs with, with, an elect, with a, a hybrid car, there is no stow and go tub. So we replace it with regular flat sheet metal. Hmm. Um, so the stow and go tubs are, are the, the backbone of the gas car. And then with the, the hybrid, we have a, a different structure that we put in that replaces the stow and go. Do you lose any of that structural no, rigidity? No, oh no, absolutely not. We actually, because we, without the tub, we have straight rails, and it, it's able, we're able to maintain the rigidity that we, we have mm. in the gas car. Uh, Don Wagner wants to know, why recycle the Pacifica name so soon? He also goes on to say that he had a 2004 all-wheel drive, and the only problem was poor rear visibility. Mm -hmm. Yep. I, you know, I had a Pacifica too, right? When, when it was on, I, that was, I, everybody says, why are you using the Pacifica name? And I'm like, that was the greatest car I ever had. So it's a great name. It's got great name recognition. Um, and, you know, we really love it. I think it's- But I gotta believe you it. that Christ, the marketing people wanted a name change just so people don't think of this as, right. as a minivan. Yep, you're absolutely right, right. And I'm, a lot of the research we did set thought of the town and country is a lot of people would harken back like, oh, that's, that was my dad's minivan with the, the wood panels on the side. Or, that was my grandpa's minivan. I remember taking a trip when I was seven in this minivan, and you know, my mom really didn't want to buy a minivan, but she bought one anyways with the town and country. So we're, we, you know, as we developed this and as we were driving this, the Pacifica, we were like, this is different. This is not like the old town and country. This is, this is light years ahead of what it is. We thought it deserved a new name, and, and we loved the name Pacifica. So it was a, it was a good marriage. Rogerio wants to know, and he, he, he says, by the way, he's a prospect for you guys. Okay. Is the plug-in version primarily an EV with an onboard generator like a Volt, or will the gas engine drive the vehicle when the battery is depleted like the Fusion Energy? Yeah, it's, it's, a, well, it's a parallel system. So the, with, as, your, as your battery, with, as you're in charge depletion mode, your, your uh, transmission, the motors in your transmission is driven through the, through the battery. Then as you're in what we call charge sustaining, um, you have both uh, electric and the gas-powered motor in parallel working with it. Um, he also wants to know, will uh, the battery be liquid-cooled? Oh, yeah, for sure. And he wants to know, what, what kind of take rate do you think you'll get for the plug-in version? Yeah, we, you know, it's uh, speculative at this point, so we're still trying to work through that. Depends on the price. Yeah, absolutely. And you still have the same Pentastar engine in the plug-in hybrid version? Yeah, it's a slightly modified, it's a, it is the Pentastar engine, slightly modified to be efficient with the, with the hybrid. Mm -hmm. Let's see, uh, Argel Brian Augustin says, what about the Chrysler Pacifica trail hauler, the 770 horsepower all-wheel drive minivan? I, I just want to see it even in concept form. <laughs> <laughs> No one's working on that yet. <laughs> it's a great idea. I'll take it back. Let's see. Uh, and Philip wants to know, uh, please explain the active noise control functions from this standpoint. Is it to reduce road noise, powertrain noise, 
intake exhaust noise? Mostly for powertrain noise, for the most part. And that's why it's a great, it's actually active noise cancellation for us was really another great um, fuel economy enabler. Um, in general, some of the best noise that it cancels out is the powertrain noise. So as you, you talk about compromises, so one of the big compromises of all cars with when you're calibrating your engine is um, how loud you want your engine to be versus how efficient it is. So many times, if, oh, the engine, you're getting a lot of engine noise, you have to, you have to, two things in the calibration that would make it less fuel efficient. Um, so this, the active noise cancellation really allows our engine to be a little bit louder. We don't have to, we don't have to calibrate that out. Mm -hmm. And we use the ANC, the active noise cancellation, to allow the engine to be, to be more biased towards fuel efficiency as opposed to being biased towards noise. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was really, uh, a, really one of the great enablers and it, it got us some improved fuel economy as well. And Kville wants to know what's the towing capacity compared to other minivans and yep. crossovers. Uh, we're, we're right at we're 3,600 pounds. We're right at that. But the whole minivan industry is right in that 35 to 3,600 pounds for the did, gap, for the. Gap did car. anything surprise you when you were looking at the other minivans? That, you know what they did, and you said, "Well, that's interesting." No, you know they're um, both. I think both our competitors are pretty mainstream, pretty fundamental. Um, you know, I think we we pride ourselves in it looking like we think they kind of copied us on a lot of the things that we did. So um, some of the things looked familiar to us because they were kind of we thought copying from us. But um, you know, uh, they're they're pretty fundamental. I don't think there's anything that we would uh, that we really would say let's copy that. Mm -hmm. We thought we had some great ideas on our own. You know, Toyota Sienna on the top line model. I think that's the XLE. They've got captain's chairs in the middle row mm -hmm. with footrests that right. come up. Yeah. You ever think yeah. of doing that? Because yeah. I thought that was terrific. I think it's yeah. one of the best middle row seats in the business. Yeah, well, and we love, we're, for, for us, for our minivan, it's, we love the stone go. The customers love it. They love the tubs. They love to be able to put the seats all the way down, be able to get plywood on there. Put you know, my wife on our minivans we have for 15 years. And we have the video games and games and toys and balls, and we use that extra. It's another four and a half cubic feet of storage. Um, and we use that like crazy. So um, with that, we love to have the stone go, and that stone go is, is what we really, we, we think the, our customer really, really enjoys. And you guys went all out with the infotainment yeah. systems in this vehicle. Oh, yeah. Out, yeah, the, 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 that all-new um, the theater uh, system that we've got. And it really is a theater system, right? So it's, it's um, got, it's more than just a, a video player. It's got, it does have a Blu-ray DVD. One of the coolest things, though, it also has eight, eight game apps. So it's got tic-tac-toe and checkers and in a hangman version and Sudoku, so it, it's really great. Um, so you know, when, when, for our Pacific, our, my you know, my kids used to always want to always yell at shotgun. They always try to get in the front of the front seat. And for for now, especially with our and en en entertainment system, we can play games against each other. So you can play tic tac toe or checkers against each other. So my kids always run in the second row now and try to play the video game. So that um, the infotainment system is is outstanding. We've got you can see there the. Um, are we there yet? So it, it kind of answers that that age-old question: Is you know when, when the kids in the back, are we are we there yet? And it's, there's actually one of the eight apps is that. So it, it'll tell the kid in a nice pictorial methodology of of you know, how how long until the trip's over. So they don't have to ask you anymore. One less one less thing to ask. Bet you wish you had that, huh? I definitely do. And one of my other favorite features was the fact that uh, you know one could could watch one movie at one time and the other can watch something entirely different right. on their screen and thought, do you know how many fights that would avert yeah. on, a, on a family road yeah, trip? Yeah, it's great. And also has the, it comes with the headsets where you can listen, be listening in, in, on the different screens. And also another real cool feature is the, the rem remote control. So it's got a, a touchpad remote control as well. So if the child's smaller, they can't reach the screens, uh, can use the touchpad of the remote, can play the games, can control what, what video and audio they're listening to. And you must be thrilled with the styling that design staff gave you because oh, yeah. I, I got to tell you, I, I, I hear people who say they hate minivans mm -hmm. say they like the Pacifica. Oh, yeah, absolutely. We've got nothing but rave reviews on, on the appearance, right? It's it, it kind of what, what we're going for is it wants to be the, you know, the, the cool mom or the cool dad now. Right? That's we, it doesn't want to be that, that, that paneled, old paneled minivan. So it, it is, there's no doubt it's absolutely beautiful on the outside. Our, our design office just churns out one great looking car after another. And it's just another in a long line of beautiful looking cars from, from Chrysler. And the minivan presents that challenge of you, you have to start with sliding doors and, right. and the design, you know, I would think would have to start at that basic foundational yep. level. Absolutely. Yep. It sets the middle of the car and the whole uh, silhouette of it. So it's, it's, where, it's got, where it has to start. Mm. Well, good. Mike Downey, thanks so much for stopping by and bringing uh, a Pacifica into the studio. This is really it. 
These two guys have driven it. I haven't driven it yet. I'm dying yeah. to get into this yep. thing. Great. Love to have you in one. Well, thanks for having me. It's been great. Yeah. Good deal. We're going to take a quick commercial break. Give a shout out to our friends at Bridgestone. We'll be back to talk all about the news of the industry of the week. Okay, we're back. And uh, we're back to talk to Dr. Data. Yes, indeed. We, we, so there, we, there's got to be a number, right? All right, so, so, so this, is, this is a very perplexing number, set of numbers here, and I'm, I'm hoping that you guys are going to be able to figure this out for me because for the life of me, I cannot figure this out. So, so Carmen, could you bring the first number up, please? All right, so, so here's, a, here's a couple figures here. So this is March 7th through 10th, 2013. So Back then, we were, three years ago. So we were paying three dollars and seventy-four cents a gallon for gasoline. So Gallup went out and asked people, "What is your level of support for alternative energy?" So you think that people might be rather supportive. This is a Gallup poll. Gallup poll. Okay. Right. So fifty-nine percent of the respondents to the poll said alternative energy. And they pay more for it. They were, they were looking for. You know, we got to do this. So Carmen, please bring up the second. So here we are in 2016, three years later. Price of a gallon of gas, $1.87 a gallon. Support for alternative energy, 73%. So look at, let's look at these side by side here. Okay, so it's almost inverse. So doesn't it seem that when gasoline costs more, that there would be greater support for finding sources yeah. of alternative energy? Yet we find that gasoline is cheaper, and the number of support, it, it, it's gone up. It's gone up. What's the deal? Have, have people put their money where their mouth is when they've made their purchasing decisions would be the third uh, number I'd like it, to see alongside there. Uh, in, in what regard? Well, are, are they buying products that would, would fit into that alternate energy uh, mindset, such as a Pacifica hybrid, or are they going to go with the, the regular Pacifica? I, I think... You know, maybe with climate change, you know, garnering more attention in the last few years, maybe that's influenced that number independent of gas price uh, in terms of support for alternative energy. But, um, you know, I, I still see people rushing out to buy SUVs today. So if, if they if 70 something truly do support alternate energy uh, alternatives, where, why are they making the, the purchasing decisions that don't reflect that value? What do you think? I'm stunned at these numbers. I um, I don't get the inverse ratio thing, that when gas prices are high, fewer people support alternative energy. Now gas prices are cheap, and 79% and say that they support mm -hmm. it. W one thing I'd, I'd say is, kind of to Pete's uh, point, don't listen to what people say. Watch what they do. Because, you know, going back a few years ago, there were polls that were done of how much more would you pay for a car that got better fuel economy? And people were talking about thousands of dollars. They, oh, they'd happily pay more for a hybrid and even more <laughs> for an electric. And then they go into the showroom and they go, ooh, I want the heated steering wheel and the premium sound system and the fill in the blank, but they would never buy the alternatives. Mm -hmm. I don't know. What do you think, Gary? I, I, I was beginning to think that maybe... People feel more comfortable. Okay, gas is cheap, and you think, oh, yeah, maybe it'd be a good idea that maybe they had to, you know, look into alternative fuels. Maybe we had to make some investments because, you know, this isn't taking it out of my wallet every week when I'm, you know, going to fill up my town and country or, or what have you, right? I mean, and, and so it's just the comfort level with their own economic conditions. I mean, I heard uh, today that um, the first quarter of this year is the least amount of money that we've paid for gasoline on average in 12 years. But wow. But the funny part is, is that, I mean, I thought it was funny that they said the, um, the amount of money that we have extra in our wallets in this period of time is $45. So, so that's the difference it means. You know, I mean, it would seem to me to be much higher. But, but speaking of alternatives, big night tonight, huh? Yes, it is. Model 3, Tesla's Model 3 tonight which will be a, a blowout media extravaganza. So, 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 Pete, tell us what the Model 3 is, for those who don't know. It's essentially an affordable Tesla uh, electric car for the masses that, uh, that Elon Musk has talked about developing for many years now. Uh, this is kind of a key component of his plan to bring electric cars to everybody and at, at an affordable price. 
So I think we're st t talking about starting at $35,000 before the, the credits uh, for buying the car. And, you know, perhaps we get somewhere south of $30,000 for a all electric car that gets a 200 mile all electric range. Yeah, what no. What do you think? I, well, look, I, I, I think the car is going to be fantastic. I think the two cars that uh, Tesla, I guess I should say three cars, if you count the Roadster and the S and the X. Uh, but I think what Tesla's done so far, product-wise, is fantastic. I expect this car to look gorgeous. Uh, I think somebody uh, was reporting today, Bloomberg was reporting, they're expecting the range to be 225 miles, right. a 65 kilowatt hour battery pack. Uh, it, we, we come back to the question that we've debated on the show. Is, can they make money on this car? Because we know that so far, even from an operational standpoint, they're not making any money at all. And when you throw in the whole nut, you know, uh, amortization of the tooling and whatnot, they're losing boatloads of money. So the real question is, can they make a profit on this car? And what I find interesting is they're t saying this is not a downsized Model S. This is an all-new architecture. Everything's different on it because they recognize you, you can't just downsize an S and go from $70,000 right. to $35,000. It, it doesn't work that way. Well, in they fact, they, they developed complete. a whole new platform for this car because this, this will be a platform for other vehicles going forward in the showroom. So, you know, you know they'll have a crossover vehicle presumably, and, and Elon has even talked about the possibility of a pickup, um, mm -hmm. which sounds sort of crazy, but... Uh, um, well, delivery pickup, that would, that would make a lot of sense. Uh, you know, I think he's given us no reason to doubt some of his more audacious statements uh, <laughs> thus far, so why not a, why not a pickup, mm -hmm. I guess? But, it's, but it's, it's interesting. I saw, I, I saw a photograph um, today of a guy who was sitting outside a Tesla dealership this was this was like you know he was he was waiting for tickets to see the Beatles or something you know what I mean it was just yeah, I've seen pictures of of lines of probably in excess of a hundred people for of just people waiting to sign up to they're not getting their let, their let, Model Three today they're just waiting to put their name on yeah, the list and and, and and it's a thousand dollar deposit but see this, this for a car they've never seen one thing that I love about <laughs> Tesla is that it's put a lot of excitement back into the automotive business. And the, the news that the announcement was coming today was all over the news. Mm -hmm. And I, I tried to think, you know, when was the last time I heard a mainstream car being talked up this much in the general media? God, I think you'd have to go back to the 70s or the 60s or something to get the national media saying, oh, there's a new car that's going to be announced tonight. You don't get that anymore. Right. Tesla's clearly been able to tap into right. that excitement. So, so, it's, it's, so it's an Apple announcement or a Tesla announcement. I mean, that's basically what it comes down to, right? I mean, this is what excites people. Okay, so, so here's, here's another question regarding this. What, if any, consequence will this have on the Chevy Bolt EV? Ooh, interesting. Because, you know, Tesla is going to start taking deposits on this car right now. It's a thousand bucks. You can get it refunded anytime you want, presumably. So are they going to suck a bunch of EV orders, you know, pull them up in advance, and then people are going to say, oh, I like that Bolt, but, you know, I already got a $1,000 deposit on the, on the Model 3. I think what's going to be critical is can they launch this Model 3 when they say they're going to, which is the end of next year. So the Bolt's going to be out for a full year before the Model 3 hits the streets. And I think a lot of people might think, and especially if, oh, there's a delay, folks, it, it'll be early 2019, by the way. How many people say, bugger it all, give me my 1000 bucks back, I want to go buy a Chevy Bolt instead? Yeah, I think especially the, the other factor with that, too, is it's going to be easier to walk into a dealership and, and buy your Chevy Bolt than to, you know, to order a, a Model 3 that you're going to wait for and... Clearly, there's the whole Tesla versus the car dealers issue that uh, makes it harder to go find that Model 3. So, you know, I, I think that combined with the fact that the Bolt is going to be, be available earlier, uh, you know, really favors Chevy and, you know, their competitors in some sense. And I, I think that that Model 3 maybe is a, attracts a different buyer, too. So, you know, I, I think that it probably hurts the Model 3 a little bit, that it's just not going to be as widely available. 
Um, but it won't stop the people who really want one from, from getting one. So, so is, is, there, is there a finite number of people who will buy an electric vehicle of any type, or is this something that can expand? I, I think it can expand. In fact, that was a big part of our discussion on last week's After Hours. You know, or, or I should say uh, an, another show that we, we taped at New York um, that, that has not yet aired is, uh, you know, Bloomberg, what's it called? New Energy Investments or whatever. They're predicting that the hockey stick, you know, chart is 2023. They're predicting that's when electric car sales will really start to take off, that batteries will continue to get smaller and cheaper and lighter, more and more charging stations will be out. They're predicting that 2023 is when sales really start to take off. In fact, they're even projecting that this could cause another collapse in oil prices. Hmm. Do, do you think that there's the possibility of growth? I, I, I mean, I mean, I mean, obviously, if if you have more choices, there'll be like more people. But I mean, more than just incremental growth. More than just incremental. That, that changes the question a little, a bit. little I, bit. I think there's room for expansion. And, uh, you know, I don't know if we'll see this real revolution in 2022, 2023. But, um, you know, I, I definitely see more electric cars on the road, uh, you know, over the next five to 10 years as those battery prices come down. I think I think there's room for it. To I don't know, maybe it'd be four or five percent of the market. I mean, because you got, I mean, you know, in New York last week, uh, Carlos Ghosn was was talking about leaf sales, and and you know, and and he admitted that he thought there would be more leafs sold than have been sold. Well, and, a number one, let's change the styling, brother, and then see what <laughs> happens. But anyway, th didn't mean to interrupt. No, but I mean to the po <laughs> but to the point that if if we if we look across the board at the available, you know, pure electric vehicles that are out there right now, I mean, it's it's. It's not setting the world on fire. I mean, it's just it just simply isn't. No. And I mean, and if we if we look at hybrid sales, I mean, Prius sales at least are 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 fairly robust and and have. That's the end of the story. The rest the of end, them at don't the end sell. Of the story. Right. Right. And and so you know, I begin to wonder whether or not people are just you know having negative feeling about electric vehicles overall. I think they do, especially right now. They're very expensive. They have limited range. They are not easy to plug in. You can't find charging stations everywhere. Some states, that's a little bit more different than others. But in a lot of states, you can't easily find a place to, to plug in. But I think we're on the verge of seeing that change. I, I think this 200-mile range that the Bolt and the Model 3 are going to have, I'm not going to say those are the game changers, but that's going to open up the market to a lot more people who would have otherwise said, I, I can't get by with 70 miles. That's just not good enough. And realistically, that's where most of these cars are now. So what, what do you think, Gary? Are, are we at a tipping point? Why, or why do you think people don't want to buy EVs and plug-ins? I, I, think, I think range at this point is still the big inhibitor. And I mean, and I think that we, you know, I, I think that pretty much uh, Elon is selling every Model S he possibly can sell, which of course has a greater range than any other electric vehicle out there. And so then if Bolt and Model 3 come to market with a greater range, I think people are going to be more receptive to thinking about that. But still, I think these are people who maybe are slightly ahead of the curve that are, are you know, willing to take some risks in terms of, uh, you know, buying something that's different. And another thing that's going to be a big factor, though, and I think this is going to play to Elon's favor that Chevy doesn't have, at least at this moment, is the fact that he has that recharging network and has been creating that recharging network across the country, not True. just in California, yeah. not one spot. So, I mean, you know, you come down to this thing of saying, okay, you know, you're, used, you're pretty used to going to a gas station and spending five minutes pumping gasoline in your car. You know, how receptive are you going to be when you go up to a level two charging station and it says three hours and 40 minutes? You know, I mean, no If way. you're lucky, three hours and 40 minutes, it, yeah, it's going to be more like right. six hours. But uh, so, you know, that, that's, a, that's a big hurdle that I think that, the, you know, the infrastructure build-out has to happen. But, uh, but people are certainly willing to pay some serious money for this. Um, I, I just saw another thing that Tesla announced that sort of slipped under, that uh, the ludicrous mode that they were offering for the, uh, the, the P90D. Well, apparently it used to be that when you bought your $108,000 P90D that you had to check the box for 10 grand to buy the ludicrous mode. Now, what does ludicrous mode mean? It means that, okay, if you buy the normal car, you go zero to 60 in 3.1 seconds. 
but if you have ludicrous, you go in 2.8 seconds. So 10 grand for three tenths of a second. Sounds good to me. <laughs> and, and now, there, and now, now you, if you have the car and you didn't buy it that way, for 10 grand, I'll let you, you'll be able to get ludicrous mode. So it's a, uh, it's a, it's a, they know how to upsell their customers, I mean, don't they? I mean, just think about this. Absolutely. I mean, is it an over-the-air update where they it's, add it's that, a, that it's functionality? A, it's, it, 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 actually, it is a it is a, a soft grade or software upgrade, and that but they also have to um, replace the standard fuse to a and I quote advanced smart fuse, and then they have well, that's got to be nine grand. And then that. they have to replace <laughs> the main pack pack connector to use Inconel rather than just normal steel to be able to. To handle this, but I was thinking, ten grand for going from three point one seconds to two point eight seconds. You know, I, I bet if you look at performance cars out there, like BMWs, you know, and and what the upsell for uh, an M series is, and what the the acceleration improvement might be, Tesla may not be all that far off. Wow. They may not be, but you know. Uh, Going back to it, too, I, uh, a reason why people don't buy electrics, plug-ins, hybrids, I, I think a huge problem is the way that they're marketed. And I, I, I spent some time this morning looking at that advertising, and they talk about technology. Ooh, this has, you know, what, 30 kilowatt hour lithium ion battery. Well, who knows what that, the public doesn't know that stuff. And you talk about, uh, oh, you don't have to go to the gas station as often. Well, that was the argument with diesels, too. And, you know, uh, you're doing your part for the planet. Well, you know, as we've seen, about 3% of the new car buying public, you know, will plunk their money down to do that. So I think there are great attributes to driving EVs. And this is why I do believe that they will take off in the future. They're quiet. I mean, I'm driving a Chevy Volt that's out in the parking lot right now. It's quieter than most luxury cars. We've all talked about the instant torque. And it's so true. So if you see an opening in traffic, boom, just go for it. Bang, you're, you're, you're right there. And then you've got this screen, and it's showing you all this stuff. And so you, you try to play this game. You try to get the most braking efficiency that you can. You try to get the most range that you can on the charge that you've got. So there, there's fun aspects to driving these cars. You'll never see that in any of the advertising. If I were in charge of the advertising, I would tell you how this electric car is going to make your teeth whiter and, and improve your sex life. That's and, how you and, sell okay, cars. Speaking of which, what do you make of the FTC charging Volkswagen with uh, um, fraud for, for selling the clean diesel? Look, this is a clear case. I mean, you know, the Federal Trade Commission's job is to, to watch truth in advertising. And they've got VW called. And, and, you know, in their ads, they specifically talk, we've reduced, uh, you know, oxides of nitrogen by 90%, when in fact, of course, they didn't do that at all. So it's a, to me, this is a slam dunk. VW's in big trouble from the EPA, the FTC, and the Department of Justice. Mm -hmm. yeah, if I understand correctly, too, the FTC suit allows the FTC to share in some of the, the global settlements that may, may take place, too. So I think it's a both a strategic move and, and, as you said, a slam dunk that, uh, you know, this is just one more big, continuous headache for Volkswagen. Boy, those guys have just been snake bit because they had to recall all of their e-golfs last week. That I didn't see. So, yeah. so, tell so, me so they're recalling that. nearly 6,500 electric e-golfs cars in the U.S. to address a battery problem that can cause stalling. So basically, it's a software glitch that tells the tells the system like, "Ooh, overload," and then it just shuts the system down. So they could figure out how to write the software to cheat on <laughs> diesel emissions, but they can't figure out the software to keep their EV running. Another software problem. Yeah, for yeah I mean, they, I mean, it's, it's just it's just incredible. I mean, these these poor. Oh. Well, it'll and, be interesting going forward overall. I mean, I think this is a canary in a coal mine. It's maybe another issue of. How, how many times are we going to start seeing going forward recalls for software issues? Right. And we saw one with, with Chrysler, obviously, uh, over the summer with the, the Jeep hack. Uh, but, but here's something else, again, that's very specifically related to the software causing a safety problem. Mm -hmm. And this is why everybody needs over-the-year updates in their cars, ASAP. Mm -hmm. Because if you find a glitch, 
boom, you can fix it without the owner even knowing about it. Absolutely, or certainly without having to go to the dealer to, to get it fixed, which then reduces that recall completion rate uh, significantly. Exactly, exactly, Ryan. Yeah. You know, as Rich, did you guys, either you guys read the interview that Ryan Bean of um, Automotive News did with Alan Brown, who's the chairman of the Volkswagen National Dealer Advisory Council? No, no, no. I did not see that. Oh my no. goodness! I mean, this 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 is a great interview. I mean, and and this guy, so he's you know he's in charge. I mean, he's he's a dealer himself. He uh, um, is the general manager and partner of Louisville Volkswagen near Dallas, and so he's representing all the dealers. I mean, he, here's here's a quote from the thing. They're, they're talking about the the problem with the diesel and lack of fix. It's a train wreck for both of us, meaning the dealers and for Volkswagen. He describes, he, and, and this is an interesting thing, you know, talking about, you know, the, the, those who, you know, buy more environmentally friendly cars. Apparently, according to, to Brown, for our California stores, it's literally 45 to 50 percent of their business. The diesel. diesel. Yeah. Wow. And... Uh, you know, just talking about some of the, some of the other issues. Um, I thought this was interesting. Talking about you know what is you know how is Volkswagen going to change? Because I mean, if if you look at their sales, you know he's saying that it's it's you know on the order of three hundred three hundred thirty thousand. You need more than that. You know you need like half a half a half million. Half a million. Their goal was what eight hundred thousand. Yeah. And uh, you know he's saying. Um, us waiting for Europe to give us extra Tiguans when they get done taking the ones they want must be a thing of the past. I mean, can you imagine? <laughs> um, you know, we've got, he's, he says, we've got to get going here. Passat's a great example. We know the volumes that Toyota Camry is doing. Phenomenal, right? Mm -hmm. It just boils down to what do we need? Is it another 1000 or $2,000? What's going to be the tipping point that gets us moving again in that segment? But then I got to wondering, okay, if, you, if you're putting... A thousand or two thousand dollars on the hood of a Passat, how does that help the customer out in the long run? In the long run, it does not, because it'll hurt your residuals clearly. But it doesn't matter. This is full blown, five star, red alert, all hands on deck for Volkswagen. They got to do whatever it takes right now. They just got to bite the bullet and number one, take care of, well, number one, see if they can fix the cars. Looks like they can't fix them at all. I think they're going to have to buy them back or have some sort of other pollution offset that they do that cleans up the air. But yeah, look, this is a total disaster. And they, they, they've got to figure out what to do and taking care of the customer and their dealers yeah, boy. Is, is paramount in this. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see if anything comes out of the uh, National Auto Dealers Association meeting that's going on this week in uh, Vegas yeah. regarding this. You know, I think these comments, uh, Point to the fact that this is just this is bigger than the diesel problems, which are are a huge mushroom cloud in and of themselves. But this goes to having competitive vehicles, uh, to marketing them properly. Uh, Volkswagen's had some long-standing problems that are yeah, are long standing coming to no, light. Uh, they, they better not say the e-golf cleans your teeth, by the way, because you know that that's. <laughs> I said made them whiter, no, but no, whiter and brighter. But uh, you know, I, I I just had a chance to test drive a, a Golf GTI. A uh, week and a half ago. What a fantastic car. Absolutely terrific. You know, it made me think, you know, this is still a great company. And yeah, bad people did bad things, but we shouldn't destroy this company by any stretch of the imagination. They really know what they're doing when they put their minds to it. But then I thought, so this car, so it's got to be selling well, right? It's got to be at least holding its own. No. I looked at the latest sales numbers. Every single model of theirs is down, whether it has a diesel or not. So this whole scandal is clearly scaring people away from the brand, not mm -hmm. just the diesel models. What's fascinating is how much this has affected Volkswagen versus how little the ignition switch problems affected General Motors and, and their sales. I mean, Chevy sales were up, um, you know, right away after, after all the ignition switch problems and the Cobalt and and other models came to light. Well, you know, and part of the, the, the advantage for GM, right, was ignition switch, General Motors. Ooh, have you seen the new Buicks? Aren't they yeah. wonderful? You know, people didn't necessarily make the association that these four brands, Chevy, Cadillac, right. GMC, and Buick, were General Motors. So they hate General Motors, but they love the product that's it's probably in the good showroom. Thing they took those little GM bugs off the side of the car. Remember when yeah. they <laughs> yep. insisted that they have GM on every GM vehicle? Yeah. 
Speaking of scary things, what do you, what do you make of the uh, IAHS? Um, the headlamp. The headlamp. Yes. He you know, Fascinating. So, so, so here's, here's, a, here's an industry that wants to give us all, you know, self-driving cars, and it turns out that you can buy a BMW 3 Series and have marginal headlamps. I mean, what's up with that? Yeah, it was, what was interesting in that is that there was no rhyme or reason overall. I mean, the 3 Series is a perfect example of... You know, a lot of the luxury cars were the ones that did the poorest on the... BMW M, or the 3 Series, the yeah. worst that Merce they tested. I think uh, Mercedes-Benz C-Class was among the poor showers CLA. as well. CLA, yes. Had like ATS in so, the poor category. Now, one of the things that they had said, and I, I didn't get into the details, is that automakers don't take the time to properly aim their headlights. But you guys know, at the end of every assembly line, one of the last things is you set the toe and camber and adjust the headlamp. So what do they mean by that? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I think part of it, I mean, in, in, you know, they, they pointed out, like, for example, um, and they, they use the, the Optima as an example that, that you know, which, which has these clever headlights that actually track as you turn the wheel of the car. But they, they discovered that it creates glare, which is not helpful in terms of seeing things. I mean, it's just... It's just glare crazy. for the oncoming driver. Right. And, yeah. and, you know, and the thing of it is, is that, I mean... Every automaker right now is chasing lighting technology, and it seems to me they're chasing lighting technology largely as a decorative thing. I mean, and, and we, we got to credit about styling. We got we got to credit Audi. I mean, when they came out with those LED daytime running lights, I mean, that was just the bomb. I mean, it's just so sensational. They they should have patented that idea, and then they'd have, you know they would have Volkswagen could have paid all its bills <laughs> because everyone wants to have something that has a light signature, right? Using LEDs. Yeah, you know, this guy started it, but but basic seeing. I mean, this is what it comes down to. I mean, they're talking about you know down the road presence. But what was interesting too is it wasn't just the luxury brands, but also it, um, the LED lights and the adaptive headlights to the road. Also, not necessarily any better than the, the traditional halogen, uh, right. halogen lamps. Right. See, I find that hard to believe only because, you know, we all test a bunch of cars. And driving at night, some cars are clearly better than others. And it tends to be, I think, from my experience, the ones with the more expensive headlamps on them. I'm going to have to pay more attention, clearly. Uh, the thing I'm going I'm to have to start tracking. Well, the, the, and I, you know, hats off to the IIHS for doing this. And, and they put the metrics out there, you know, both, you know, in uh, almost test lab kind of conditions and out on the road. So kudos to them. I yeah. mean, they, they got the data to show it. You know, and to your point, Pete, I mean, they, they said um, one of the best headlight systems evaluated has none of the new technology. The basic halogen lights on the Honda Accord four-door earn an acceptable rating. Now, that's not good, but it's acceptable. While an LED system with high beam assist available on the Accord earns only marginal. <sighs> Whoa. So, Whoa. you know, so now I'm sure the LED system looks really cool. Right, I mean, just like, oh, yeah, but still, well, this to your is point, this is decorative and not safety-minded. Uh, that that's probably the perfect example of that. Yeah. Well, you know what those LED headlamps on an Audi A7 or A8 cost? Replacement costs, dealer replacement costs, three thousand five hundred dollars for each side. So you're talking about seven thousand bucks replacement cost, dealer. This is dealer markup and all that, but so. I mean, for three grand more, you get a ludicrous mode on. No, I mean, it's just. <laughs> <laughs> right. Speaking of ludicrous mode, we did, we did get some comments and questions here. Uh, Robert says, Tesla's got the superchargers on the freeways, which permits the long distance. Does Bolt have that? No, you know, he's, he's just weighing in. Tony says, uh, we were talking about sales. Uh, Tesla does not have the distribution that Chevrolet has. And to your point, Pete, you know. You can't buy Teslas in every state. Chevy is everywhere. Absolutely. And, you know, I, I think watching some of those squabbles between the dealers and Tesla uh, state by state that they've had over the last few years, uh, you know, it probably really hasn't mattered all that much because the, uh, the Model S is 70,000 plus. Maybe now is, you know, really when it starts to matter is when we have two cars that are are very similar going going head to head as, as Tesla tries to enter more of a mass market. 
Well, well, we'll know a whole lot more tonight. Actually, I will know more tomorrow morning because their late Pacific Coast press conference is going to be when I'm in bed, probably. <laughs> Pete will be watching. I, no, I, I think uh, not that I'm going to be joining John, but I will also be in my bed. Uh, you know, kids go to sleep. I go to sleep. I'm not staying up uh, <laughs> to watch something remotely. That's right. All right, damn it. I'll have to watch. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, we've burned up a perfectly good hour here. Burned it up in a good way, though. So probably time to wrap this up. But uh, it was really cool having Mike Downey in the Pacifica in here. Mm -hmm. I'm jealous that you guys have driven the thing because I have not yet, and I'm dying. And, and I, back in an earlier part of my life, when the kids were still at home, we had a town and country. So mm -hmm. I'm dying to see how this thing drives. Because well, I give them credit. I mean, they took us on roads that... Yeah. You know, you wouldn't take a minivan on ordinarily. I, I mean, that would, was my sense of it. I yeah, mean, absolutely. And, uh, uh, and, and to the fact that, uh, you know, we started out on some, we come off the, the ramp from one hi highway onto some acceleration lanes uh, or on-ramps going straight up some hills. And, you know, the, the increased power uh, really made it a, uh, an easy transition from, yeah, no, from I mean, one they, to the they, other. He, you know, he was right when he was talking about, you know, building the solid bones under that yeah. thing. And uh, it, was, it was very impressive. Well, that's what I like about the show, getting somebody like a Mike Downey, and chief engineer. I mean, here's the guy that ran the whole engineering effort on it, and then having the vehicle in the studio, too. It's a great way to do it. Okay, let's wrap it up. All right. Pete Bigelow from Autoblog. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Thank great having you here, man. Thank you. And, Gary, let's do this again next week. Indeed we shall. Cool. Okay, want to thank all of you for having tuned in. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, your journey, our passion. And by Lear, a global leader in automotive seating and electrical systems. Visit our website, autoline.tv, where you can watch us live Thursday afternoons. Get your daily fix with Autoline Daily and in depth analysis and interviews with Autoline This Week. There's all that and much more at autoline.tv.